And welcome to ETF Edge, your go-to place for everything exchange-traded funds. I'm your host, Bob Pisani. U.S. regulators are getting worried that retail investors may be getting in over their heads, trading complex products like leveraged and inverse ETFs, options, even Bitcoin futures. FINRA, which is the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, they regulate the exchanges in the broker-dealer community. They're warning the brokerage community to be careful about recommending these products and asking whether more regulation is necessary, including asking things like, should retail traders be required to take tests before they are allowed to trade these products? My guest today, attorney Thomas Gorman from Dorsey & Whitney, Dave Nautic, financial futurist at ETF Trends, and Kim Arthur, CEO at Main Management. Guys, thanks for joining us. You know, Dave, it looks like FINRA is trying to describe a whole new class called complex products, and they seem to imply these complex products need even higher levels of regulatory scrutiny than there are already. So suss this out for us. What's the implications for the ETF community and for retail traders if this goes ahead? Well, I think the important thing to remember is this is really just a request for comments right now, but we all know that that's often sort of a stalking horse for new regulation. Mm -hmm. What they're really trying to do is create sort of a, if you will, a second class citizen of product. Uh, but the, it's not based on structure, and this is a really different way of approaching regulato regula regulating products in the United States. Historically, we think about a structure and we say, oh, well, if you're not an accredited investor, for instance, you can't invest in this type of fund. This isn't doing that. This is saying that a regular old 40 Act mutual fund or ETF that meets certain inclusion criteria based on what it owns would be in a different bucket. And then the question is, once you put everything in that bucket, how do you get access to it? It's not clear where we'll end up, but they have said in the past that things like target date funds or emerging market funds or even a tactical asset allocation fund are all too complex to be considered plain vanilla. With a broad definition like that, this could have a pretty chilling effect on not just the sales of those products, but frankly, investor portfolios, because these are really powerful tools that investors have come to rely on. Yeah. You know, Tom, uh, FINRA seems not just concerned about a lack of education on the part of retail traders, they also seem concerned about the lack of education on the part of the brokers. Um, some of these products are incredibly complex. You and I had a conversation about this last week, and you quipped that you could have a PhD in economics and still not understand them. I is there some reason for FINRA to be concerned? Thank you, Bob. Thanks for having me. Yes, you're exactly right. Uh, there are, there's real concern here on the part of not just FINRA, but the person behind FINRA, otherwise known as the Securities and Exchange Commission, because they've been bringing enforcement actions based on this issue. And it's an important issue. It's just starting to emerge in their enforcement cases. But the point here is these products are incredibly complicated. They have one, for example, uh, that I'm familiar with that was in one of the enforcement actions where you were supposed to trade it for one day. One day. The people who were put into it by their broker held it for a year. You can imagine what happened to those people. They got slaughtered. It's not enough to be a sophisticated investor, which is largely based on money. It's, you know, it may not be enough, as you said, to even have a PhD in economics. You've got to understand what these particular products, which are oftentimes very complicated, are designed to do. This is classic Warren Buffett. If you don't understand it, you can't invest in it. And that's what's happening here. And the first line of defense here is the broker-dealer. The broker-dealer is supposed to have policies and procedures in place that say, this is how you teach people about this stuff. This is what this stuff is. And in the cases the SEC's brought, those weren't being followed. This is, yeah. this is a simple right. situation in, of not following the rules in the beginning. Yeah. So, it, Tom, what intrigues me is they went through great lengths, FINRA did, to remind their, their members that regulation best interest, that's Reg BI, that was adopted in 2020, that it requires brokers to act in the best interest of their customers when they're making these recommendations. And that implies brokers need to be able to explain to the clients the nature of the products they're recommending and the risks and rewards, and they're supposed to determine if the investments are suitable uh, for the clients. The tenor of all of this seems to be some of these products are just not suitable at all. That seems to be the underlying tenor, Tom, or am I trying to read too much into this? 
No, I, th I think there's a legitimate question here. Um, I, I wrote an editorial about some of these a while ago, raising the question, is disclosure enough? And in some instances, it almost seems like it's not. These products, the one that I was talking about a minute ago that you can only buy for one day, that's in the disclosure. Now, the disclosure looks like a lot of these documents. It's you know, probably 40, 50 pages of fine print that nobody can read, but this has got to be implemented. You don't necessarily need to write new rules. You need to make sure that the ones that are on the books are being enforced so that people understand what they're buying and selling and they don't hold a one day product for a whole year because you just, you just lose. So that's the place to start. That's where FINRA is trying to start. That's why they put that release out. I'm sure that that follows in the wake of those SEC enforcement cases. And if yeah. that starts to come up along with Reg BI, which, which you're exactly right, that's what should be governing a lot of this stuff, then you might say, well, maybe we need to do the disclosure a little bit different. Maybe the broker has yeah. to say, here's, here's the pamphlet, but here's five things that if you don't understand them, you don't want to buy this. You know, Kim, uh, you run a management firm. Uh, do you use these complex products like leverage and inverse ETFs? Is there a reason for FINRA and the SEC to be concerned about these products, in your opinion, as a financial uh, advisor? Yeah, Bob, thanks a lot. Um, yes is the answer. We do use these complex products, uh, <clears throat> mostly options. Um, and they're mostly covered called options. So. Uh, the big difference with that is you're using that to dampen volatility, create another stream of income, or hedge against larger swings. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with what Tom just said that, you know, like you said, red BI is, is best interest. And if you don't have enforcement of the disclosures that are written in there, that's a problem. But when you do have enforcement, it's a blunt reminder that there are consequences. So I, I think personally that um, they are complex, but there's tons of disclosures that are written there. Make sure the regulators are there to enforce, to show that there's consequences. But in the meantime, you just continue to do uh, increased education uh, alongside the regulation, or in the case with our clients, they're like sold to you, main management. You guys are the professionals. If you choose to use these complex instruments, I trust and know because you have our best interest that you will do the right thing for us um, because you have that fiduciary. Yeah. You know, Dave, uh, embedded here, there was a whole series of comments on what they're calling self-directed platforms. They seem to mean Robinhood and online brokers platforms that don't have any financial advisors. And many of these complex products, they note, are sold through these self-directed trading platforms. Mm -hmm. FINRA seems to imply that the platforms have very high levels of obligation to their clients. And I guess the question is, what are those obligations? And if there are obligations, where do you draw that line? If somebody wants to go broke, you know, trading stupidly complex products uh, on, on Robinhood, is it the fault of Robinhood? Where, and where's the line here? Well, you don't need a complex product to go broke day trading on Robinhood, right? You can just go to the <laughs> OTC sure. bullet board stocks and you can do just fine on that. True. Uh, but I think the problem here is that we've had a 90-year record of a pretty solid disclosure-based system for these issues, right? We have chosen in the past not to look inside product and say what this owns is bad and therefore it has something else. That's what's really nefarious about the way this is being positioned, because not only are we going to do that look in, but then you're going to obligate the broker to somehow segregate that out and then create some sort of testing regime, probably with a continuing education requirement, that you would then have to enforce on individual investors. That's really a slippery slope, because you introduce all sorts of issues of education, bias, access. It becomes a real problem. So. I'm not saying that there's no issue here. There are obviously very complex products out there that folks really should understand before they invest in them. But I think the system we have right now is the right direction. I agree we need to enforce it. I think better standards around what appropriate use of disclosure in a self-directed environment is important. For instance, do you need more than just a little pop-up window the first time you trade a leverage and inverse fund? Or should you be reminded every time you interact with a product like that about its features that make it complex. That would be my approach here, right? Improve the disclosure right. system by providing clear guidance. Although as Tom pointed out, you can have 
disclosure and still have confusion as he did with that uh, ETF that only traded one day or resets one day at a time. So, so Tom, what about Dave's point? There's already numerous safeguards in place for investors who want to trade anything, want to trade options or futures and warrants, whatever. Uh, there's suitability requirements when recommending these products. They all, these already exist. Uh, and, and determining uh, that there's a, a reasonable belief, the customer has the knowledge, the customer has the experience to evaluate the risks. Why do we need more? Is it a, is it a good idea to require tests? That seems to be a, a, much, a whole new level of regulatory uh, um, in, in interference, perhaps. Not necessarily interference, but a whole new regulatory structure. Now, Dave makes a good point, and I agree with him. There's plenty of disclosure out there. There's all these all these documents written that lay out in minute detail in some instances what's going on with this. What's the problem with with that is retail investors don't read them. Retail investors don't understand them, and you can't make them read that. But what you can do, and this is this is where. Uh, FINRA is really stepping in here and doing doing a good service, at least the start of a good service is, you can make the brokers implement them so that in the policies and procedures that your brokerage firm has, for example, you might single out some of these so-called complex products and say, look, we want you to do this, this, and this to make sure that people understand what they are. I don't think you want investors taking tests. One of the things that's happening now, though, is you see with, and let's not pick on Robinhood, but they're an example of this, is with more and more investors coming in, and particularly younger investors who are not particularly sophisticated in this stuff, they start trading and they put their money in and they've got you know whatever they've got for money to put in there, they put it all in and then they lose it. Why? Because they didn't read what they were what, what they were supposed to read, and the broker, more importantly, didn't tell them. So, in, in my favorite case about the one day the one day turnover, had the broker sat down and said, "Look, one day, really one day. What's what's more suitability? How long can you hold this if it says one day? You hold it for two days, three days, a year? The broker hasn't done what he really needs to do, and what he or she really needs to do is say, "Look." You can't buy this thing if you're, gonna, if you're not going to trade it out in one day. You can't buy this thing unless you can really afford to lose all of the money here. If you want to buy it after I tell you those things, that's your decision. I'm not going to tell you not to buy it. That's up to you. You're the investor. My job as the broker, which is what FINRA is trying to do here, what the SEC is trying to do here, and what they probably spurred FINRA into doing is saying, write better rules. We don't need new ones. We need better ones to mirror what's going on in the marketplace today so that we're protecting investors. But a test would be a new rule. So, Kim, is, from your point of view as a guy who manages money, is it reasonable to ask for some kind of minimal competency test? That's what we're talking about here. This, is, this would be the new regulation. Is it reasonable to ask for a minimal competency test? Tom's point is disclosure may not always be enough if they're so complex nobody reads it or understands it they just have a sort of very very minimal understanding of what's going on yeah i think the minimum competence makes sense and a lot of that exists like if i if i you know first have to fill out if i'm going to trade options for myself and my own account i've got to fill out a form that asks me some questions about my experience and understanding of options so that definitely hits it i would make a comment to what tom just said for myself personally, and I think for a lot of people, one of the best educators and one of the best life lessons is when you lose some of your own capital. When you lose some of your own capital, you usually stop and then go back and educate yourself so that you don't make the same mistake again. So I think, I think making it too you know, burdensome with a test uh, again, if, um, uh, uh, on the self-directed platform, people have the ability to go ahead and outsource to professionals, and they know that they're that they're professionals going to take care of them. If they're doing it on self-directed, um, it's kind of like I like to look at Bob. I don't have to take a test to select a healthcare provider with my PPO, um, and the consequences are far higher: loss of life versus loss of capital. So again, I go back that that system set up there in the capital markets that when you lose money, you usually double up your efforts personally to make sure you're not going to make that mistake again. 
Um, yeah. So I, I just, I kind yeah. of firmly believe you can't make it so burdensome. Right. Tom, the SEC is also very worried about this. FINRA regulates brokerage firms and exchanges, but it's subject to the oversight of the SEC. It's important for people to understand the relationship between the SEC uh, and FINRA, that SEC essentially subcontracts uh, regulatory functions, a lot of it to FINRA that has oversight over the brokerage and the exchanges. But Gary Gensler, the head of the SEC, has been very critical of these complex products in the, in, the pants, in the past. So my point is, it's not a coincidence, right, that suddenly FINRA is very concerned about this. Can you draw the relationship between Gensler and, and, and FINRA at this point? Oh, exactly. Gary Gensler is very, very worried about these products because they're not the kind of products that he wants to see individual retail investors trading absent the kind of disclosure that I'm talking about. I'm talking about changing the way that brokers do the disclosure so that they're ensured they can make sure that people understand what the limitations of these things are. And, and unless people really get that, you don't have to write new disclosure rules. But if your brokerage firm, for example, said, look, this is a very complex product. So uh, here's five things about it that you need to know. Put them on a flashcard, hand them to the guy and let them take a look at it. And then they know. And if they want to trade, then they can trade. Self-directed platforms are a different problem because you don't have that. And for those, I think either, either you're going to have to write, add on to the disclosure rules to say some, something's going to get delivered to these people before they can buy some of these very sophisticated products, or you may want to put them off in a different category. There are whole categories of products that individual retail investors can't buy because they don't have yeah. sufficient experience and knowledge to do these things. So, and that's, you yeah. know, that's one of the things that I think we need to really look at here. Yeah. You know, uh, Dave, uh, looking at the questions that FINRA asks in this, in this note, I'm reminded that this is kind of the way Gensler works with, with his, his other regulatory proposals that the SEC has, just ask questions. So let's ask, do you think we should uh, make retail traders take tests? What do you guys think? And then they craft a regulation to essentially uh, uh, do to it. To do that, can, yeah. Can you, can you, like, I know it's hard, but can you handicap the chances of this actually happening, going through like this? It's going to take some time. So I, I wouldn't be too panicked that this is all of a sudden in June we're going to have a different regime, right? This is a request for comments. Those comments are due by May. Then there'll be a period where they do nothing. And I would suspect towards the fall we'll start seeing some comprehensive looks at whether it's through FINRA's eyes or SEC's eyes, how to approach this issue. My hope is that we use this period to give good comments, right, to, to put our actual opinions in there. I encourage investors and advisors to do that as well. Put those comments in. Talk about how you use these products, and hopefully that will push us into a direction more like what Tom was just talking about, maybe a better disclosure system, a clearer disclosure system, but not one where we're building standardized tests for people who want to invest in a target date fund. Yeah, uh, and uh, Dave, just to remind everyone how this actually works, so the comment period runs through May 8th. People can comment on it. And what happens after that? Of course, then they have to go through the, the standard procedure. They have to look at the comments and issue if they want and more if comment, they want, more they requests, or they can go through a rulemaking stage, right? Yeah, so until there's actual proposed rulemaking, we probably shouldn't run around like hairs on fire. But I do feel like we need to pay attention to these initial salvos in these battles because we've seen this before, right? I mean, this is sort of how we ended up with good regulation like the ETF rule, right, 6011, was through a long process of this commenting back and forth on what should or shouldn't happen. I think we're probably going to go through something similar here, so I think it's really important to pay attention. I don't suspect we'll see new rules in place this year. I do think we'll see new rules yeah. proposed this year. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important that we, uh, we, we look at this uh, and stay on top of it because these have a way of sneaking up on you. So, uh, mm -hmm. folks, I would just pay attention to, uh, to all of that. Uh, folks, that's it. We've run out of time here. That does it for this week's ETF Edge. Thanks to, Tim, to Kim, Tom, and Dave as well. And we've asked Dave to stick around and chat a little bit more about ETF trends on our ETF podcast. So stay for that. And remember, you can see all of our shows on our website, etfedge.cnbc.com. Everybody have a healthy, happy, and safe trading week. 
of ETFs with the ETF Edge newsletter, your weekly update on the hottest trends in the nearly $4 trillion market of exchange-traded funds, expert analysis, actionable ideas, and exclusive insight from host Bob Pisani. Sign up now at cnbc.com forward slash ETF Edge newsletter.